Welcome to the world of Pokemon. What you see before your eyes is the Sinnoh region, a place with overwhelming beauty, musical scores that will inspire and uplift for years to come, evolutionary forms that will bring our cherished Pokemon to a bright new era, legendary beings whose deep mythos can be explored as well as debated. It is a region like none other, and it is ready for you now. Good times, my old friend. Good times. Now if only I could play you without your screen coming off! When Pokemon Diamond and Pearl versions were brought to my attention when I was in junior high school, I had a couple of thoughts. The main one was, OH MY GOD NEW POKEMON! You see, internet was kind of a new concept for me back then, and I was wide-eyed when my friend showed me a list of all the new friends I would make in the upcoming games. Thank you, Serebi, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Pokemon like Pochama and Chirinbo, all this was so overwhelming, and those legendaries, oh my goodness. Even though I didn't have my own Nintendo DS, I was still just as excited for the new games to be localized. This looked crazy! And when I finally got my DS and my copy of Pokemon Pearl, I already knew how the game was because I played on a friend system. Yeah, it kinda took a while for me to get my own adventure going. I just mooched off my friend for a little bit and played his. A little bit back then, meaning a month or two. A little bit now means a couple years. Nevertheless, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. Waiting for that honey tree to shake so we could get a female combi, counting down the days until Friday so Drifloon would appear at the Valley Windworks. All this stuff can be seen as gimmicks for sure, but there was a magic to it. And I think that defines Sinnoh for me in a nutshell. It's magic. There's no region quite like it. I still prefer Hoenn, but nothing feels quite like Sinnoh did, before or since. It was a landmark in my life. The first time I had friends was 2007, and it was the first time I could experience a Pokemon game with those friends. I mean, G imagine being able to evolve a Haunter for once because you had someone to trade with. So needless to say, there was a lot of hype going into the eventual Sinnoh remakes. We all knew they were coming, it was just a matter of when. Then finally, in 2021, we got them. They sort of blew our expectations out of the water, though mostly not in a good way. And now that Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl have released to the world, it's time to ask that penultimate question. Disclaimer, this video is not meant to incite or demoralize anyone enjoying Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. While I have a lot to praise with the games, I have a lot more to criticize. These are my own opinions and in no way invalidate yours. Oh, also, uh, spoilers. So let's paint a picture here. Pokemon games nowadays can't seem to catch a break. There's always something to them that just doesn't live up. And honestly, it is not Game Freak's fault. It's hard to make consistently good games when your release schedule demands yearly entries. And it's of no surprise that the quality sort of started dropping when Game Freak was pushed more and more to make that sweet November release date for the holidays, which led to them trying out something new, commissioning another game development studio entirely to make a Pokemon game for them. I mean, I guess Genius Sonority doesn't count anymore, but whatever. These would be the first mainline Pokemon game created by another studio, Ilka. And does it show? Ilka did a really good job creating a game that feels like legitimate Pokemon. Though to be fair, they did have a good framework to design their remakes off of, and Junichi Matsuda helped direct the games, unfortunately. I, I mean, fortunately, fortunately, yeah, M M Matsuda's great. He's the best. He makes me not want to go run off and play my cell phone games. Now, if you had told me this wasn't Game Freak and I didn't know beforehand, I would honestly be surprised. Despite what I will say going forward, one thing I cannot deny about this whole situation is that the Pokemon company handled these remakes very well. Because if you want something completely original while still being in the Sinnoh region, you get Pokemon Legends Arceus. But if you want something mind-numbingly similar to Diamond and Pearl, you get Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. Simple, yet effective. Honestly, Honestly, the hardest part in figuring out if Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are good remakes is the fact that they're pretty solid. These games don't suck, in my opinion. Now, if you're tired of the Pokemon formula, they are based on games that didn't really shake anything up when they released, and a lot of quality of life changes that occurred over the past 15 years are not here, such as making adjustments to shiny hunting or making Eevee training easier. So let's break it down bit by bit, starting with... 
The original Pokemon Diamond and Pearl versions barely carried a narrative. They are by the book Pokemon games, which isn't bad. I personally love stories in Pokemon, but I know a lot of people that don't. You see, Team Galactic's just kind of there. The legendaries are cool, but they don't really have a lot of weight or build up for that matter. If you're just mashing A the whole time, you could completely miss why Cyrus is even at Mount Coronet. Huh? Are we fighting? There isn't a lot of choreography or interesting camera angles to convey motivations or show impact, which is a staple of Pokemon games nowadays. A lot of the show-don't-tell aspect, if you could call it that. Story is a hard thing to compare in these games because, again, they are really faithful remakes. The entire original story was rebuilt, brick by brick or a uh, bit by bit. All the lore, all the barebone character motivations. Unlike previous remakes, there really isn't anything added. No reveal that Silver is Giovanni's son, no hints that Team Rocket are regrouping and will strike back in two years, no lore added to the legendary Pokemon to show how much they actually mean to the region. It's ultimately disappointing, not gonna lie. Mostly because Diamond and Pearl are rich with stories to expand on. There is some crazy lore in these games, and the legendary encounter can have some real weight to them with proper buildup. Like, imagine a canon reworking of Arceus to make him fit in with the games as a legitimate catchable legendary like Deoxys was. Though you could make an argument that they're saving that for Legends Arceus. Darn you, Pokemon Company! The sad thing about all this is that character and story moments were actually added to the definitive Pokemon Diamond and Pearl game. Cyrus's speech to Team Galactic was a phenomenal addition in Platinum, and really added to the cult-like state of the villainous group itself. Looker felt like an inside look into how dangerous Team Galactic is if they're left unchecked, and Sharon's involvement in the post-game made it feel like the whole affair wasn't something you could just sweep under the rug. Which is funny to me, because in the remakes, they just sweep it under the rug. Isn't it so nice that we're cleared of all charges, Cyrus? I literally was just about to delete you and the entirety of Team Galactic. All these were scrapped in favor of the true remake experience experience. TM, something Cacnea has dubbed simply as LOL NOT PLATINUM. You see, there's a lot of LOL NOT PLATINUM in this game, so expect to hear that more and more as we go forward. As for other characters, they're left unchanged as well. Ilka added nothing new, so I'll speak about them in general terms. Professor Rowan is still Professor Rowan. Fun fact, he's actually my favorite professor. I don't know, I just like the no-nonsense attitude he brings compared to Professor Birch, who I had to babysit and make sure he didn't get mauled by Buchiana. Don and Lucas are are actually kind of better. Wait, wait a minute, what is this? They added something new. What? But I literally just got done saying Ilka added nothing new. Well, you could just trim it out in editing. Don't destroy the illusion. Yeah, Don and Lucas are able to be battled in the post-game. This is entirely new. This wasn't even in Platinum. It was something I always wanted to see in the originals. I hated that you could battle with them, but you never got to battle them. I was always curious to see what Pokemon they had and how good their starter was. The one we didn't pick. This is a dream come true, honestly. Lol, not Platinum. What? What? What does that mean? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. Okay, well, who's next? Oh, Barry! I do like Barry a lot. And it's funny because back in the day, he was considered to be the friendly dumb rival. But nowadays, Barry is like blue compared to these other scrubs. Side note, it was so nice being able to name him again. I don't know why Game Freak has this weird fascination with not being able to name your rivals anymore. Like, it would be so nice to be able to play Sword and Shield without being friends with a kid named Hop. And I doubt whoever wrote Hop as a character was really pulling for that name to stick. Barry is honestly a lot of fun, and it's maintained in the remix, even though I'll miss his intro sprite from Platinum. <laughs> million dollars, but his new animations are still pretty great. I mean, look, the guy even runs on water now. We're reaching levels of ADHD that shouldn't even be possible. The gym leaders are actually better than they were in the original. Even though they didn't get those redesigns we wanted, they have much more charisma in their animations now. Rourke especially. Instead of being like, look at my helmet, he actually has a lot more poses and personality now, and that goes for all the gym leaders. You can really get a sense of who they are now instead of looking at static sprites. Even though there are still static images, of them plastered on the screen to start the battle, but we'll get to that. The stat trainers are also back, and I still love them. Cheryl, Riley, Buck, uh, I, I want to say 
Amy? And Marley, too! She's definitely my favorite. Can't wait to battle her at Buck's Battleground in the survival area. Lol, not platinum. Wait, you can't battle them? You never get to see them again? Lol, not platinum. Well, shoot! What am I supposed to do now? If you want to catch Shaman, you'll never see her again! And now is the time we talk about that blonde hair destroyer of lives, Cynthia. Oh, she's back. And about time to... Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> oh, she's back. And with a vengeance, her character has changed in the only way that matters. She is much harder. I didn't think it was possible, honestly. Or if it was, they wouldn't care to make it so. But no, Cynthia's AI and team are prepared to wreck your life. All of her Pokemon now come straight out of a Smogon tier list. They not only have better movesets from Dominant Pearl so they can cover their weaknesses better, such as Garchomp carrying Poison Jab, to deal with fairy types, but all her Pokemon now have items, and good items at that. Garchomp isn't all like, Citrus Berry! Now it's a Yacht Berry, a berry that has super effective ice moves. This team is absolutely nuts. In my first playthrough of Brilliant Diamond, I literally spent a solid 15 minutes of game time trying to take down her Melodic because it held a flame orb and I couldn't status it. And it kept burning my team while it just sat there and recovered. Oh, and don't think just because she is using her Diamond and Pearl team that you're safe from her Togekiss. It comes back in the rematch. But, but I thought there was nothing from Platinum in this game. I missed the part where that's my problem. It's attention to detail like this that tells me that Ilka actually tried fulfilling those memories that you had of Sinnoh in general. Take this for example. Garchomp is coded to come out last, which is genius. It's the grand finale, and it's the ace in the hole that everyone knows her for. Garchomp is the one that your team is exhausted to go against. Not gonna lie, Cynthia definitely caused a few resets trying to figure out what to exactly do to beat her team. Dormammu, I come to fight her. Dormammu, Dormammu, Dormammu. Trico, how many MCU references are you gonna make? As many as are needed, I'll take a step back. A point of heavy contention with the remakes are their graphics. Surprise, surprise, a Pokemon game on Switch looks like an upscale 3DS game. Look, I personally haven't been too vague on what I feel about the direction these games went for. You can literally see the exact moment my heart breaks in two when I stream the announcement. Oh my god, they actually did it? They did the obvious? Thank you, Game Freak. Unless they're trolling, but I don't think you should troll your audience. I don't think that's a good business model. Oh. Oh no, is it? Is it? Let's go. Now first off, credit where credit is due. These games do look better than how they did when they were first revealed. That doesn't happen with Pokemon games usually. So thank you, Ilka, for making the effort there. But yeah, these games are still disappointing in how they look. And funny enough, it's not so much when it comes to the battles and environments, but more to the general overworld itself. The character models look great when they're scaled to a realistic height. And not gonna lie, these environments look absolutely gorgeous. They left much more of an impression on me than Sword and Shields. I legitimately went back to see if Sword and Shield had as good as environments, and they kinda don't. Now, Sword and Shields do change based on terrain, just like these games do, but I find the backgrounds in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl to be much more vivid and varied. It legit feels like you're battling at that exact spot. And don't even get me started on how it looks depending on the time of day, cause Wow. One of my favorite backgrounds is, oddly enough, Team Galactics. At first, I didn't like how they just had a blank background with a G on the floor, but once I saw that the admins get planets and Cyrus has an entire galaxy behind him, I was really into it, not gonna lie. There's a ton of these, too. Nearly every boss trainer gets a unique room just for them. Shout out to Bertha and her sand humidifiers. The attack animations are pretty much the same, but they don't bother me as much as they do for other people. I've pretty much just accepted my fate that I'll never get to see mega kick animations for literally every Pokemon that exists. My main thing is how the games look when you're out of battle. 
I don't like it. The graphics are stylized. The graphics are not stylized. When you're seeing the models this close and you're able to make out how low the resolution is, that isn't stylized. That's a limitation. This is stylized. This is what the game developers were aiming for instead of making something that looks quote unquote realistic. There's multiple layers to why I think the graphics just look bad for the remakes. For one, I just dislike the idea that we have to go back to the same style the DS had. It really undoes the entire point of remaking something. I wanted to see the vastness of Jubilife City in a way unshackled from what the Nintendo DS could pull off. Why am I restricted to viewing it the exact same way I did in 2007 on a modern game console? It just feels so backwards. I really wish they carried the modern flair that Pokemon Sword and Shield had. I thought you hated Sword and Shield's graphics. I thought they were underwhelming, sure, but I've made it quite clear that I've never really had an issue with the graphics in specific. There's plenty of moments in Galar that look really good. Of course it could look really bad too, but it's never really bothered me. The lack of Pokemon was my biggest critique against it, because I appreciated the scale of Sword and Shield and I would absolutely kill for Sinnoh to be shown in that same scale. If Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl look exactly like like Diamond and Pearl? I just have to ask. Why play something exactly like the original when I could just go play the original? Have you thought that maybe people don't have the originals? Of course I have, but I don't understand why that's even an argument. Sure, if you've never played the originals, you're getting something new out of it, but for everyone else, we just have to sit through the same exact game we sat through years ago. Why not just make something that appeals to everyone? Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum will always exist. It's not like they're going anywhere. Until Nintendo purges all emulation programs, it is. So why limit the graphics to capture that same feeling again? See, when I hear remakes, I expect a modern remake of something that I cherished years ago, capturing the feel of the original while adding something new. Remakes such as Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire decided to convert what the original Ruby and Sapphire did and show it off with the power of modern graphics. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl don't. There's no dynamic cutscenes because they really couldn't make it possible on Nintendo DS, so there's hardly any here. But when they do try and make it look dynamic, it just looks like this. <laughs> oh no, here comes Cyrus! He's so tiny! The characters are tiny. While some of them have expressions, not all of them do. It just feels like so much missed potential for a game that could use a fresh coat of paint. See, the thing about the original games is the graphics aren't meant to be taken literally. They're a product of the time. For example, when you fight Reggie Gigas, you are not fighting a giant wooden standee. When you fight Crasher Wake, he doesn't make one pose, then stand motionless the entire fight, sliding in occasionally to remark. Arriving to a town doesn't literally mean it only has three buildings. Giratina showing up to stop a tiny Cyrus sprite isn't meant to be how the scene is interpreted. This is probably how they wanted you to interpret the scene with your imagination to fill the gaps. The Pokemon that comes from shadows. So you did come to interfere! Now, of course you're saying, Trico, that's obvious. It is obvious, but it still has to be stated. In the modern age, you're able to scale our trainers to proper sizes and show the Pokemon in detail, as well as give them cinematic cutscenes. We don't have the limitations imposed on us by older graphics. I know I'm beating a fainted Mudsdale, but just hear me out. Imagine Final Fantasy VII Remake is announced. The hype levels are out of control for this legendary game. Then on release day, you're greeted with the same exact game with upscaled chibi models doing the same turn-based combat. No one would buy that. I'd buy it. What? No. No, you would not. Of course I would. I love Final Fantasy VII. I, I'm, I'm going to ignore you now. Anyway, TLDR, the battles look great. The overworld generally doesn't, except for the water. Especially the water, because for whatever reason, that's like Pixar quality water. Time for us to talk about the music! Something that is often brought up about Generation 4 is how good the music is. This was a time where Pokemon games weren't restricted to having beeps and boops for their music anymore. You could actually have a piano playing on the DS and it would sound legit. Now, my overall consensus for Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl is that the remixed music sounds pretty much the same on average. That's not their fault though. There isn't a lot you could do with the original songs to make them sound modern. It's not like jumping from...
For these remakes, you're going from... On average, this soundtrack feels so similar to the originals, but it's a give and take for sure. For every Team Galactic grunt theme not having enough bass, you have a Stark Mountain theme sounding more like Donkey Kong 64. That's like the second Donkey Kong 64 reference I made today, what is going on with me? The differences in the soundtrack are so small that they're hardly worth mentioning. On average, I do mostly prefer the original tracks, but I can't deny that's just the nostalgia bias. The new soundtrack sounds good, nothing much to report. Which is what you thought I would say. There is something to report. This. What on earth is this? It's the original music. Is it? Is it? Why does it sound like it's coming from a 2007 cell phone instead of a 2007 DS? It always sounded that compressed. I mean, sure, maybe, but why did it have to sound compressed? Period. Ilka, you literally could have just downloaded the high quality rips from Pokeli's channel. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, this is a nostalgia. Oh, 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 okay. Ah, uh, exactly as I remembered it as a child. Dishonorable nitpicks? What does that mean? It's all the small nitpicks you have on the game. I mean, I do have a lot of small nitpicks, but I thought I shouldn't even bother bringing those up. There's a lot of small things I do like about the games. Oh, well in that case... That doesn't really fix the issue, though. Then I'm just talking about all the small things I liked and not addressing anything bad. What about this, then? That's a lot of words in that section title. You have a lot to say. Alright, alright. Uh, here we go, I guess. Hirashi! The Poketch was brought back, but it doesn't update by touch, making it pointless as something easy to access. It also doesn't have a back button, because... LOL, not platinum. Badoof's running in to help is an amazing reference to the HM Slave memes. You get the feeling Ilka not only knows what Gen 4 is, but what it is known for in the eyes of the fans. Sylveon isn't in this game. It's just one Pokemon to add from later generations that evolved naturally. It didn't stop the Pokemon Mystery Dungeon remake from having it, but whatever. Grand Underground isn't bad. The original was underwhelming since we were coming off of secret bases, but there's actually a point to the underground now. Really, no Alolan forms and no Galarian forms. They're easy to add, and they don't take up Pokedex space. I mean, even Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee knew this, and they suck. The slates are such a good idea. Seriously, give whoever thought about referencing the original cartridges as ancient stone tablets a raise. Cyrus looks much more intimidating in Ultra Sun and Moon. There, I said it. The artwork for Cyrus conveys heavy lines in his facial features, which has always been a thing in all of his appearances. Here, it just looks like he shaved. Okay, so this makes no sense, but Cyrus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn show up at the Battle Tower as possible rematches. I do not care about the logistics of this. I just love being able to battle them an infinite number of times. Please bring this back, please. Super Smash Bros. Brawl has a better remix of Team Galactic's theme than this game does. Thank god you could customize your trainer. Even though it's limited, it really helps these games feel like a new experience since you don't have to look like this dork anymore. You can't customize Customize your hair! Why can't you customize your hair? I want to look like that girl! The animations that the trainers utilize are consistently excellent. It really breathes some life into the sprites from back then. Some animations follow the LOL NOT PLATINUM design by not including the intro animations. Rest in peace, Flint's iconic laugh. <laughs> this game, at least at release, is broken as heck. The most popular glitch to do is to bring out the menu while a battle is happening, and then you can clone Pokemon. Legit Legitimately feels like a callback to the original games and their whole void exploit. And not gonna lie, I kind of missed cloning Pokemon. It was a fun thing you could do in Emerald, giving yourself multiple rare items, having duplicates of the same Pokemon in case you want to have another move set on hand for competitive. You can even clone those single-use old Gatos. Mmm, old Gatos. Why doesn't Palmer have Frontier brain music? I know that there's no Battle Frontier, but seriously, why not just have the Platinum music? 
Shadow Garatina does. What is the point of Shadow Garatina? I like having it for sure, it's really cool, but it just reminds me that the distortion world isn't in this, because lol not platinum. At the end of the day, I just can't help but compare Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl to the original Definitive Sinnoh game, Pokemon Platinum. The unfortunate truth is that when fans say that Sinnoh is a really good region, they're usually referring to a region perfected in Platinum version. It fixes a plethora of absurdness that the original Diamond and Pearl games had. The story is generally paced better, and it has a more gripping finale. The Platinum Pokedex was accommodated to include all newly added evolutions, as they were Sinnoh Pokemon as well, but for whatever reason, Diamond and Pearl counted them as National Dex Pokemon. Not to mention it fixed this. Who on earth approved that being so slow? Diamond and Pearl were ridiculously slow for kinda no reason. Real talk, whenever I went back and played through my Pearl version again, I'd have to turn off the battle animation since you'd be saving yourself another minute of battle time. Nowadays, Platinum's fixes don't really matter on terms of making the original games feel smoother. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl feel like modern entries and everything is streamlined, thankfully. But unfortunately, Platinum wasn't even considered to be on the table when it came to making the remakes because lol not platinum. Of course we mentioned the literal handful of upgrades the remakes have from platinum, but it's a bit shocking why they were so dead set on replicating, let's be honest, flawed games. You can argue it's because they're remakes of Diamond and Pearl in specific, but that didn't really stop previous remakes from including stuff from their original definitive releases. I mean, geez, Heart Gold and Soul Silver completely rip off the original Crystal version. They're essentially Crystal remakes. You'll be here all day if you continue comparing it to the other remakes. Oh, I would be here all day. Which is why I shouldn't... Wait. Why don't I just compare them to the other remakes? Because you should judge something based on what it is compared to what it's not? Balderdash! It's only fair to talk about how I viewed the other remakes in the series just to offer some perspective. Oh no! The first remakes, they are tailor-made to be a modern, for the time, Kanto playthrough in good ways and bad ways. For a kid that didn't get to experience red and blue growing up, they were phenomenal in offering a modern style. That being said, the games are comically restrictive in forcing you to have a Kanto-only team. No evolutions! No trading from Hoenn games! No having fun! Fire and Leaf Green set a bad trend that persisted through Emerald. No national decks until post-game! These remakes retained the challenge of the original and the charm of it while offering new ideas entirely, such as the Sevi Islands. A really neat set of locations that essentially added a smaller subset of the Johto region to the game, complete with Pokemon and remixes of the soundtrack from Generation 2. It's still weird to me that Mount Silver isn't in the game, as that's canonically a place that Red goes, but you could also make the argument that you'd essentially have to remake Johto as well. While not the best remakes, Fire Red and Leaf Green are very good. To this day, they still stand as the best games to experience the Kanto region. Come at me! Arguably the best Pokemon games in the franchise in a lot of ways. This is solid, concrete proof that Game Freak can be a great developer when they try. The immense value and size of the games are still impressive 12 years later. You get a remake of Gold and Silver that is very faithful, yet can be customized to your liking. The freedom the games allow is remarkably refreshing, leading to a metric ton of variety. And it helps that they shamelessly threw in a lot of elements from Platinum in there as well. They all also show that you can borrow from a definitive version if you want, hence why it shares a lot of its DNA with Pokemon Crystal, down to remixing its menu theme instead of the original ones crazy enough. It just felt like Game Freak jammed everything they could into these two little games, whether it be something they had to recreate, or just copy and paste from the recently released Platinum like I said. I can say with certainty that they're objectively the best remakes on a strictly gameplay design standpoint. A 
Unfortunately, the Hoenn remakes had big shoes to fill with Game Freak's ever-shrinking feet. <laughs> that's, a, that's a weird line. I had really high expectations for them, and looking back, I can see my expectations were never gonna get fulfilled. Not only were Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire following the best remakes in the series, but they were also remakes of my favorite Pokemon generation. Hoenn is home to me, plain and simple. Literally, look at my Twitter. It's canon that I live in the Petalburg Woods. At the time, I dubbed these entries as the good X and Y, which isn't fair to them at all. Not X and Y, Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, it's not fair to them. Because Oros did one thing that no remix in the entire franchise has done before or since. It repackaged Hoenn from the ground up and gave it the interpretation of modern Pokemon. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, Hoenn just has much more charisma to it now. A charisma Game Freak discovered much later in the franchise's life. From trainer designs, to mechanics, to story, to fan service, to fulfilling playground rumors, to quality of life changes, to reworking the legendaries so they returned to being the competitive gods they were in 2003, but unfortunately lost their luster over the years due to the power creep. By the way, Primal Groudon and Primal Kyogre are still the coolest legendary forms, and I hate that they're roped in with Mega Evolutions. I grieved them like a departed loved one. The freedom and variety they allowed to play through Hoenn was appreciated as well. You can do whatever you want! And the game even breaks itself at points and just says stuff like, screw it, we know Wally didn't have a Gallade in the original, but we're just gonna give him a Gallade. You guys are cool with that, right? This game solidifies the question I've been asking. Why play something exactly like the original when I could just go play the original? The remakes don't invalidate the original games. The original games are still the original games. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire have Hoenn's charm, but they feel completely new. And going back to those trainer designs, man, they're so good. Flannery is conveyed in a way that doesn't confuse me anymore. You could feel the awkwardness radiating. All these peeps got such a glow up. And don't get me wrong, I love the original designs, but I'll be darned if I said the original Archie is even a fraction as awesome as the new pirate-inspired Team Aqua variant. Yar! Oh no! Look, I could talk about these redesigns all day, but I'm already on a side tangent, so let's just move- Oh no. These games are the worst games in the entire franchise. They are insultingly awful. I purchased Let's Go Pikachu for like 20 bucks on eBay, a solid year after it released, and I still want my money back. Now, before I rip into these games, allow me to praise the only two aspects. You ready? Okay, here we go. Overworld Pokemon. This sounds weird because a lot of people dislike it, but this is my favorite feature. As a kid, random encounters always bothered me and ruined the feeling of exploration when I had to pop a repel every minute, but being able to naturally traverse a cave or swim through the ocean without having to battle Pokemon is a wonderful feeling, really. And playing through Brilliant Diamond with the original encounter method again only confirms how much I prefer overworld encounters. It also makes this game the best game to shiny hunt. Period. Not only because shiny hunting is so streamlined here, but you could see what Pokemon is shiny from the overworld appearance. The second pro, Pokemon walking behind you was done phenomenally in this game. All Pokemon are scaled, and they follow at an equal pace with you. There is so much attention to detail when it comes to the ones you could ride, whether it being Kangaskhan's pouch or riding on Charizard's back. This game fulfilled many things I dreamed of doing as a kid. It is so Oh, awesome! Alright, that's enough praising. These games suck. The difficulty is the worst. You literally press A the entire game and you win. The difficulty somehow gets even worse when you bring in a co-op partner, which the game doesn't even adjust for. Yeah, this game's the only one in the franchise that lets you do co-op, and it completely messes it up. Nah, it's okay, Matsuda. It's not like it was a feature we all wanted for years or anything. Trace is the worst rival in the series. It's, it's not even a hot take. I think everyone knows it. He has zero personality, other than being nice, unlike how, who actually was nice to a fault, and Hop, who lamented his own powerlessness compared to yours. Trace is so lame compared to Hop and How. How is that possible? Pun unintended. It features only the original 151 Pokemon to no one's surprise, and also Melmetal and Meltan, but you can't evolve Meltan to Melmetal because you have to do it in Pokemon Go? Uh, screw you if you wanted to adventure with Meltan, I guess. It removes the additional features from Fire Red and Leaf Green and doesn't offer replacements. Nothing. 
Nah, the post game is non-existent. The only thing you could do after beating the game is this weird system where you have to battle level 100 trainers for all the Pokemon. I don't know why. You just do. The reward is that you get to fight Red, which, you know what? That's pretty cool. And he has his original design. Sure, I'll give it that. And also, Green's in this. Green from the manga, I think. It's a weird thing where Green can be interpreted as Leaf, but she also has a manga variant, so whatever you want to think, really. Regardless, these are red, blue, and yellow in the worst way, and they taught the Pokemon company an unfortunate truth. Pokemon will always sell, regardless of quality. <sighs> <sighs> How much time did that take? Well, you burn through eight minutes. I hope everyone is given a bit more context of what I expect from remakes now. I'd like to think I'm not too entitled. I can appreciate good things, especially when you see worse things later on. Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are not bad. The original framework helps, but we saw that just because the original games were good doesn't mean the remakes have to be. Not only does Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl take me back to a much simpler time in my life, but it has so much potential to fulfill things I never got to experience. I never got to hatch a Manaphy, and I never got to run across the Seabreak path to catch Shaman, officially. I never got to travel to New Moon Isle and catch Darkrai, officially. All of us never had the chance to receive the Azure Flute, play it, and reach Arceus's domain, then take that Arceus to the Sinjo Ruins and get an egg of Palkia, Dialga, or Garatina. That's Heart Gold and Soul Silver. I know, I just thought I'd sneak it in there. There's so much room for opportunity here to explore the old, but ultimately, I would like new stuff here. I want new trainer designs. I want reworks of older Pokemon. Palkia, Dialga, and Garatina are just the same old Pokemon that they always were, and they're not exactly rare either. We just had the opportunity to catch them in the Crown Tundra DLC last year, and heck, it's possible you still have the shiny versions of them because they were given away in 2013. 2013, oh, I'm old. I forgot. Maybe, maybe you don't have these. So with all this context and all these facts and all this rambling, do I think Pokemon Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are good remakes of Pokemon Diamond and Pearl? No. No, I don't. I don't think they're good remakes. Simply put, they just don't do enough for me. The reason I have fun playing them, as well as playing them with the rest of the community, is because they're Diamond and Pearl. And I love Diamond and Pearl a lot. I love Platinum more, but Diamond and Pearl are still good. It's like I'm playing Diamond and Pearl in the modern age. When I first played these games, the world wasn't as connected as it is now. I mean, having fans to play with also helps. I didn't have fans or YouTube when I was 12. Oh man, could you imagine that? What? I couldn't replicate what YouTube videos were like in 2007. My camera and footage are literally 2 HD. By themselves, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl succeed as fun Pokemon games. It's amazing seeing people that never got to experience Sinnoh able to play it now. But for those of us that played the original games until our thumbs cramped, it's just playing the originals again. So you want to know my ultimate thoughts on how I view these games? Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are subpar remakes. However, Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl are great remasters. There you go. Everyone should be happy with that result. This video's still gonna get bombarded with dislikes. <laughs> oh, Cacnea. Like that matters. <laughs>Special thanks to my top tier patrons Liddy Kitty, Terror XD, Nancy, Trico Simp, Bumblebutt, and Ice.